So then we start getting into like the cloud and data center architectures. Again, we're going to talk about uh, uh, the setup here. But before I get into it, uh, so I can make sure we, we, you know, make sure we hit all the points. One thing that we did is actually redesign the UI. And I'm going to talk about why this is powerful here in a few minutes. But this is, again, just a sample of, of what the UI is going to look like. You see a big difference before, between before and, and you know, the way the UI looked and what we have now. And I'm going to get into the, to the why behind there's such a big difference, actually. <coughs> you know, as you start migrating a cloud, you know, there's really three options. Either don't migrate the cloud, slowly migrate the cloud, or make it all greenfield. Right. So one of the interesting things is whether you're deciding to go into a, a, a cloud environment uh, or heavily orchestrated environment, or you're actually trying to migrate applications from a legacy environment to an orchestrated environment, you have to be able to uh, do this. And so we have different uh, technologies that enable that. You know, about, uh, you know, if you go look on my LinkedIn profile, you'll see that I worked at a web hosting company called Brinkster. They do now do DDoS protection and things like that. We had a few people managing 500,000 websites. We automated everything so we could keep the data center team down to three people. Every, most of the stuff is just rack and stack. You don't see that stuff anymore. Now you have big teams doing all sorts of stuff. But we, we said, back then when we didn't have, anyone remember Cozy back in the day? The Perl APIs for managing Cisco devices and stuff. I mean, we were, we were sitting there just automating the stuffing out of everything because we realized it. What we didn't realize is maybe we should have actually released that to the public because, they're, you know, now instead of OpenStack, it could have been Mike Stack or something like that. But at the end of the day, yeah, bad joke. So one of the things is that um, we, we start looking at these new technologies and we start saying, how can we, one, provide transition technologies to cloud, but also uh, as applications are slowly move over, how can we actually service them in both both arenas? So one of them is uh, one solution is overlay, right? So we are uh, we do act as a VTAP, right? We support VXLAN. Uh, right now it's, it's primarily unicast, and uh, Guru can actually comment as needed. Uh, we support again 64 tunnels, uh, thousand tunnels, uh, you know, 64 VTAPs, and basically uh, we have the ability to not only to support, let's say, VXLAN, but translate that from VXLAN to MVGRE, or you know, MVGRE to IP you know, infrastructure only, or uh, basically to, uh, let's say, a VLAN infrastructure. So we can actually take all these technologies, and if you think about it, we're concentrating all these technologies, and we can move traffic and messages over these different types of infrastructure. Pretty powerful. And oh, by the way, I'm giving you a central point of control for your services. It's very interesting. You said unicast mostly. I'm assuming you still do multicast. Uh, no. Okay. So where do you receive your VTEP to Mac mappings? Right, right. So it's either uh, static map. Uh, we have static mappings either from the controller or from your we can take static mappings, a lot of static mappings from the controller or from any orchestration entity. Uh, we do dynamic discovery as well. We do multi-unicast. So basically, if we know the VNI to potential VTAP mapping, mm -hmm. so we can do multi-unicast <coughs> when we have to dis do discovery. We don't do multicast currently. We do multi-unicast. But how do you even integrate that VTAP into a unicast solution? Right. Like, can you give an example, though, of where you would use this in terms of, like, integrating to what other kinds of VTAPs? So this is mainly in an NXX kind of deployment where there would be a controller managing okay. the mappings. Okay. It would not be in a standalone yeah. VXLAN environment without a controller. Yeah, because yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty new. So I was, we we're just kind of curious where yeah. Yeah. it come from. One of the interesting aspects of our platform, and, and again, as we sit down and start geeking about things is, you know, we're not as big as some of the uh, others in the industry, so we're trying to skate ahead of everyone and get to where technology's going. Uh, and that's the way we'll, we'll, you know, one beautiful thing about these new technology, uh, uh, you know, architectures is it's actually a natural leveling mechanism. So now we can actually start, you know, start trying to get ahead in certain locations and do things that make sense in use cases. So uh, we won't spend a lot of time on, on, 
on that segment, I will go ahead and just show you the VTAP infrastructure. I know you guys don't like CLI stuff. Uh, I was reading on, on the website, but we'll go ahead and just show you real quickly. Uh, after like we... it in the right context. Okay. We like it when it's built in an appropriate fashion. We'll go ahead and make sure it's really large too so everyone can see it. So one of the uh, other aspects of our platform is, right, we talked about form factors, on-demand licensing. Again, we do have AWS, and then also private clouds. We have two basic billing consumption models, is utility billing, and basically, you know, fixed licensing billing. Basically, I'm going to rent this bandwidth for this t length of time, and there you go. So it ends up making a really good thing. Uh, talk to a marketing guys a little bit more about that, if on you're the, interested. On that licensing one, so, you know, I, I think it's quite... It's, it's not a bad thing to be able to do billing based on bandwidth and whatever. But I guess the challenge that I have is that if I look at my bandwidth pr projections, I'm going to double at least every 18 months. Mm -hmm. And that gets really scary if my costs double every 18 months. Well, so it's like Splunk, you know, when Splunk came yeah. down, it's like, okay, it's quite expensive, but it's a good tool. And, you know, and then you start using it. And then you start putting more and more data in, and then the next year you put twice as much data in, and then 10 times as much data, and your cost just absolutely explodes. Yes and no. That scares people. So one of the things that we did early on uh, when we actually sat down and designed the algorithm for billing is actually the more data you use, the cheaper it gets per, per gigabyte. Yeah, I'm also thinking about, you know, like a, a small company this year uses, let's just say 10 gigs, yeah. it doesn't matter, but... Next year, that small company is going to use 20 gigs. Yep. But their revenues haven't doubled in that time. Well, maybe they have, but probably they have. Hopefully they have, because yeah. otherwise there's a bigger business problem there. Uh, well, <laughs> if I'm, like, as an ISP, say, um, so I've been doing a lot of work with an ISP, um, our bandwidth more than doubles within 12 months. Yeah. And our revenues <coughs> don't double. Well, our cost per without we, what we can charge a customer yeah. that stays about the same. I, I think one way it, it, it and again, I'm not a business guy, but one thing that we actually sat down and, and did with this, and we talked with a lot of, a lot of cloud providers and a lot of service providers, and said, "How would you like this carved up?" And utility billing and on-demand provisioning actually allows them to right size. So whatever their business requirements are, can I, I go down as well? In theory, you can. The more you consume, the actually cheaper it gets per per, per unit, right? So that's something that's baked in. Obviously, we have to keep our lights on, just like everyone else. And, you know, it's something where uh, I, I think we, we can have a conversation about, you know, some of the value of, of how we've designed the, that, that uh, yeah, it's, it's just, that you know, model. It's just about, you know, you're trying to make sure your costs, your cost curve and your revenue curves, the, the alignments, you know, the, you don't want those ones crossing over in the wrong direction. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. And, uh, but we, we have someone over here who could uh, definitely whiteboard that out with you. Um, one of the things, if, if, did I answer your question? Yeah, that's right. Okay, sweet. Uh, so one of the things that we have is, is when we start looking at our next gen, we start talking about DevOps and enterprise ready. You know, you're going to have to do it yourself. Or like I like building, you know, things at home, right? Uh, I don't like shrink wrap stuff. If I can make it myself, then I'm going to do it. Whereas we have guys who say, I don't want to make it. I actually just want to consume it. Shrink wrapped, here you go. So we have to be able to serve both camps. One of the things that we're actually doing to serve the do-it-yourselfers is we actually reorchestrated uh, and, and actually redesigned our underpinnings of our, our platform, specifically around configuration management. One of the problems that we had is when it, you could take, uh, write some code that takes five minutes for the, for the actual feature, and you spend a half a day actually writing CLI for that code. Right. What we did is actually we came up with the schema database, uh, schema based database that actually allows developers in like two minutes, like to, to really put down a schema and, and basically upload it to the system. And now you have CLI, you have X API, and basically you have all the all the bells and whistles you need. And all they have to do is hook up the back end. So we have this JSON adapter, which takes our schema, turns it into a JSON schema. And then this JSON schema, we now auto-generate our, our SDKs. So one of the beauties about uh, what we're doing on this front is we said, let's make sure that the CLI, the XAPI are unison all the time, 24-7, 365, no exception. This is the route we're going down. Because if you look at a lot of times, people hand stitch things together and when they start going, oh, I want to automate this process or this flow, sometimes it doesn't happen. The other thing we're doing uh, is with our web browser, in the future we're going to be actually putting our, our whole UI on GitHub. 
Why? Because we've, we actually went from a, a legacy uh, architecture to actually a, uh, a very specific framework, Django, that can integrate in with most DevOps environments. You uh, consider doing the same thing with your CLI? Uh, that's a question that it's a little bit more difficult because we actually, it's, it's something... Uh, it's not on top of your API. It's not on top of API. However, though, uh, we won't get into it now. What, there is the intent of actually be allowing uh, users to uh, define certain things like that. It'd be easier for you guys because you yeah, know, you're, totally. you're going down the right path of ensuring that the, that the API and the CLI are consistent awesome idea. Not a lot of people are doing that, by the way. Um, but it, would be, it, it, it wouldn't be as difficult, I think, to just make sure of that if it's actually built on top of the API. It's a natural extension of the API then. Yeah, so, so it, it, in a way it actually is. Um, but again, we're transferring from an appliance company, and so we have to take those baby steps first. Yep. But to your point, I, I, we're on the same page because we want to give flexibility and control and allow users to manage their data in the way they want to manage it. Yeah and assert their policies. So we talked about OpenStack, uh, NetX integration. Um, you know, we are part of, we are inside the NetX uh, uh, program, uh, yeah, NSX program. We are producing these little service managers, which are head-ends for basically managing appliances that can keep state information, collect stats, all these things that are needed. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we're not demoing this today because we're still going through a certification program. So uh, we'll, we'll be able to, again, uh, come back to that hopefully next year. So let me just go ahead and demo a couple things. Uh, because of the sake of time, uh, I want to make sure Rich gets up here. So I'm just going to uh, kind of go right to the uh, REST API. Uh, and then for those who want to, after fact, come up and see the VTEP configuration. I see that I love OBS over there. Um, you know, maybe you might want to go ahead and see that uh, or someone else. And then we're not going to, we're going to kind of skip over the, the OpenStack stuff just for a sake of time. One thing I do want to say is we've been involved with the OpenStack community. Matter of fact, uh, Aten wrote the no-op driver for the Elbas uh, plugin for, for the Juno release. Um, you know, we've been involved with, uh, you know, a lot of collaboration with Intel, Brocade, some of our noble competitors out there. And uh, it's one of those things where it's, it's the community aspect allows a new paradigms of, of collaboration to occur. And we want to be at the forefront of that. So let me just go ahead and <coughs> apologize. One thing we didn't really get into is the SSL intercept. And I did that twice today. So again, we actually, can everyone see this OK? OK, so one of the things that we do is we auto-generate our, our SDKs. So right here is just all the different packages for every configuration object that you can see. So we go down to SLB. Again, we have tremendous amounts of capability around each individual proxy. We have opera stats. We have all these items that you can import and do whatever you want. So what I'm going to do while I'm actually sitting here uh, uh, sitting here talking, I'm actually just going to create, uh, run a little test, I'm going to create 250 servers, right, real servers in the, our configuration. I'm going to time to 100 service groups, right, and then I'm going to take those 100 service groups and time to 100 different virtual servers. And it's actually a lot of, a very large configuration that's going to occur very quickly, right? So while that's happening, and I put all these timestamps in here, specifically just so you guys can see what's going on. And one more thing. Uh, hey, Mike, we can't see that. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and pop it up here in a second. <laughs> uh, 10. .10. And that job's already been done before I can even actually type in uh, my password and stuff to, to this Unix system. Can you actually see this? Is that clear? Yes. OK. So one thing I do want to show is talk about the CLI. So here goes basically our new CLI. But uh, if you do show run, as you can see, we have an industry standard interface, you know, typically with this stuff. But there's actually, and by the way, here goes all these objects. So we're not going to go down. And that's just proof that we did what we just did, right? But I want to show you something. Show JSON config. So as a developer, I get really mad when I sit there and go, How, what does this data structure actually supposed to look like? The docs aren't really making it clear. 
So I can go through traditional means through the CLI, configure something, and then turn around and do a show JSON and actually know what the data structure should look like. More importantly, I can templatize this, just put this in my CMDB, and it makes really a development lifecycle much easier.